Good morning, dear friends of TSM. My name is uh, François Blouin, director of the Sword Ministries Society based in Duncan. And this morning, once again, I would like to welcome you to uh, devotional number five, as together we carry on with uh, systematic theology, more precisely as we continue in um, theology proper, once again divided in three uh, major segments, as I said before. And the first segment of theology proper is theism here, and we uh, carry on uh, this morning with this. Before we carry on with dev devotional number five, as usual, we want to thank you for watching. We want to thank you for this commitment to watch these videos. I would like to encourage you to carry on uh, within the tedious. Uh, the first few sessions of um, theology proper, the doctrine of God, are somewhat tedious, difficult to absorb, and also, to an extent, with all humility, difficult to teach. So, uh, we carry on this morning. We have about this week, or maybe two more, uh, on in, uh, the introductory material of the uh, naturalistic argument, and then we will be moving on into the personalities of God, the names and the attributes which uh, will be given way more scriptures attached to it and so on. So we would like to encourage you uh, to persevere. Why don't we start together with a word of prayer and then we go for our session uh, this morning. Gracious Father, we thank you once again for the capacity and the liberty in this country to be able to proclaim your word with such a liberty if we have any kind of persecution, Father, we need to confess that in this place, it's rather mild. But persecution may come, Father, because when we want to follow you, indeed, we are persecuted. I am asking you, Father, this morning to open the eyes of our heart that we may receive what we need to receive, to understand what we need to understand. And if there is any glory to be ascribed, Father, we give you thanks and we give it to Christ, our Messiah. We pray this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Devotional number five, we carry on with theism, the existence of God, the famous capital A, and today we will probably embark capital B here. We did the work of introductory material a few weeks ago. We expounded on the cosmological argument. We also covered the teleological argument. And last week, we did anthropological argument as far as the naturalistic arguments are concerned. Today, let's take ontological argument. So this will be behind our belt in the questions of minutes and so on. The ontological argument Let's expound on this to do the best that we can. The ontological argument, basically that's the Greek expression for the teaching of being, or beings, if you want to. And I just want, right off the bat, to tell you, beloved, that this is a rather weak argument within the naturalistic argument. It's an, an argument that is rather weak. Mr. Immanuel Kant, K-A-N-T, K-A-N-T, was the first to call it so, to call it the ontological argument. The ontological argument goes as follows here. It is based upon the fact that man has an idea of God. Basically, it's based upon the fact that man has an idea of God. And because of man having an idea, an idea of God, it proves for them that God exists. And once again, it's quite a weak argument. The idea of the perfect for them must come from the perfect, from a perfect source. And the perfect source is God. I repeat, the idea of the perfect must come from the perfect source. And the perfect source is God. Now I'm going to name three of them, basically, that came up with this argument. The first person here is Anselm. Anselm here, 
backed up basically the ontological argument. He has two forms of it, but here we'll try to, trying to make it simple. Let me say three things about it. First, God is that being greater than which nothing can be conceived. God is that being greater than which nothing can be conceived. So we have the idea of an absolute perfect being. Now, secondly, in that which nothing greater can be conceived exists only in the intellect, it would not be true absolute greatest, it would not be the absolute greatest, so he must exist in reality. That was the point number two. Leading to point number three, it follows then that the being whom nothing greater can be conceived, that is God, necessarily, and that's a key word, necessarily has real existence. I repeat this point. It follows then that the being whom nothing greater can be conceived, that is God, necessarily has real existence. The second person that I would like to discuss about having something to say about on the ontological argument is Descartes. R. Descartes, it's a French philosopher. I have three small points to make about his views on the ontological argument. Descartes, we have the idea of God, number one. We have the idea of an infinite being, rather. Repeat, number one, we have the idea of an infinite being. We are finite, number two. So the idea could not come from us. We are finite, so the idea could not come from us, leading to number three, it must have come from God, whose existence necessarily proved. That was Descartes. The last one here would be Clark. Clark uh, Samuel, if I'm not mistaken, another Greek philosopher, not Greek philosopher, but a philosopher. Clark says, space and time are attributes of substance and being. Space and time are attributes of substance and being. Secondly, space and time are respectively infinite and eternal. Number three, there must therefore be infinite eternal substance of being to whom these attributes belong. I repeat the third one. There must be therefore be infinite eternal substance of being to whom these attributes belong. Basically, it says this in a nutshell to keep it simple, and I would like you to maybe Google it or get into um, um, what we call it um, apologetics books and so on. Basically, what the ontological argument says is this, that man cannot rid himself of the idea of God. Man cannot rid himself of the idea of God. The real objective existence of God is involved in the very idea of such a being. Again, the real objection, objective existence of God is involved in the very idea of such a being. So for them, ontological argument, the very idea of God proves that God exists or shows that God exists. Once again, very humbly, this is quite a bit of a weak argument because simply having the idea of something does not prove that it does exist. Simply having the idea of something for mankind does not prove in itself that the thing does exist. Men have all kinds of ideas of things that do simply don't exist. So, to uh, just finalize this point here, that was the ontological argument. 
That was number four, actually. Cosmological, teleological, anthropologi uh, anthropological. These threes here have some values. They are not the biblical views, which I'm going to get in a moment. They have some values, but this one here is quite a bit of a weak point. Now, I'm ready with you to take capital B, the biblical arguments, which is rather short, however, very important. So let me say a few words concerning the biblical arguments of uh, naturalistic argument and so on. But now I'm giving you the biblical argument. And concerning the biblical argument, capital B, before we move next week to the opposite, opposing views here, is the main substance of this work. Okay, the biblical argument here is the main substance of our study of theolo theology proper. Only two things to say, which are of capital importance. I will repeat them twice. They're very short, actually. But make a strong note in your personal notes concerning these things. Capital B, the biblical arguments. Number one, the Bible assumes the existence of God. The Bible assumes the existence of God. This is your point one. And point number two, the Bible teaches the, ex the existence of God. That is the essence of your biblical arguments. The Bible does assume the existence of God, and the Bible teaches the existence of God. And then, of course, within theology proper, we will see the personality, the names, and the attributes, and go in depth concerning all these things. As for now, we have been dealing with naturalistic arguments, the biblical arguments that the Bible assumes the existence of God, and it does actually teaches, it does teach rather, the existence of God. We will probably be spending two sessions on capital C, the opposing views of it with technical terms. Once again, I'm going to try to keep them short to make it accessible. And then we will be moving on in um, the uh, doctrine of theism again within the personality, respectively, the personality of God, the names of God, and the attributes of God in which you will delight. Lots of scriptures will be given, of course, and also read, which is always important. So we thank you so much for your support of all kinds. Take time to make your notes properly. You can pause. You can re-listen to it. It's a privilege that we have to gather. Let us pray again. Gracious Father, we thank you for your patience with us. We thank you for disclosing these things. And Lord, it's, it's easy to find for us since we, we have been bestowed salvation by grace through faith alone. And we are thankful that we can comprehend them and understand. Not everything in single details. These are complicated things to, to absorb and to study. But by the power of the abiding spirit within us, we have, despite any kind of intellect here, IQ rather, we have the understanding of them and the capacity to understand these things that are spiritually appraised. Thank you, Father, for those who are faithfully watching these uh, video channel and clips, video clips or video production onto their spiritual growth. Bless us and protect us from the schemes of the enemy, who is the one who does not want to pay close attention to these things. Help us, Father, to resist Satan and to continue in our discipleship with you. We give you thanks, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Beloved, thank you so much for watching. See you in a few days for devotional number six. Thank you for your patience with TSM. Thank you for your patience with me, stumbling occasionally over my words and so on. We bid you shalom. Thank you, and God bless you.